This is a limited series of the Rational Reminder podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making focused on cryptocurrencies. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, portfolio managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 11 of the Understanding Crypto series. And this week, Ben, you found a phenomenal, insightful, uh, I would say uh, mentally stimulating guest in Quinn DuPont. This is an unbelievable conversation that just, I don't know about you, but my head was and brain was bending all over the place because he makes so many fascinating breakthrough thoughts. Like he's a self-described historian of technology and loves to look at what humans do and how technology affects what humans do, but he just kind of shatters any sort of preconceived notion about how this all should work out. Yeah, it's like he's thinking in a third dimension uh, on to- a lot of topics. Totally, like it's just it's just such a mind bending conversation, and you know, really, he, he described this whole arena as technologies of value playground. Like you just think about that sentence as an example, right? Well, that's been that's that's what crypto's done. It's it's created technology that allows value to, value to be part of a part of a software ecosystem. Even the hype, like we've talked about hype a number of times in this series. And here's a quote he said, hype will get you to where you need to be. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 getting, it, it's getting people to rethink how the status quo works and whether crypto is the solution to that re- rethinking or not. And in a lot of cases, as we talked about with Quinn, it, it may well not be. But just by nature of getting people to rethink how economic relations and organizational structures work uh, is progressive. That That is moving stuff in a, into a different direction, whether or not crypto is the solution. And I, 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 I think that's been one of the biggest successes of crypto is that it's, I mean, just think about money. Yeah. Crypto reimagined money in its own image, as I think Quinn described. And that's caused people, including us in other podcast episodes, to think, to rethink and uh, reevaluate what money is. I don't know if I had a good description of, of that uh, until we did our own podcast episode on this, which Quinn largely agreed with, I think, when, when, he, when we asked yeah. him what he thinks money is, and he made a lot of the same points and gave a lot of the same references uh, as when we covered that topic ourselves. Uh, plus, anyway. Plus, he has no horse in the race, as he said. Oh, well... <laughs> He just wants to learn from it. He's, as I said, he's a technology historian. So Quinn, uh, his research focuses on uh, the history, meaning use and socio-technical development of cryptography. That's his main research focus, but he's been uh, researching cryptocurrency specifically since 2013. He is currently an adjunct professor at the UBC School of Information. He was previously an assistant professor in the School of Business at the University College Dublin. He's got a PhD in information science from the University of Toronto and was a postdoctoral research uh, associate at the University of Washington. Uh, Or so 2014 is when he started uh, researching cryptocurrencies. Uh, He's also helped set U.S. national public policy and he's advised businesses. He gave us some stories about advising IBM. Uh, Yeah, he's got lots of other uh, credentials and accolades that we could talk about, but I think we can we can probably leave it there and go to this uh, excellent conversation with Quinn DuPont. Quinn DuPont, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Thanks for having me. Quinn, to start off, how do you describe the ideological worldview that resulted in cryptocurrencies? This is a tough one. And I think the best way to answer this question is to just take a short sort of trip on a little bit of history and just to be a bit more specific, because we often talk about like crypto and cryptocurrencies and blockchains as this sort of homogenous mass. <clears throat> but what's really interesting is once you've sort of taken a decade's worth of uh, experience of researching the subject is you realize that, first of all, it's a highly dynamic subject. So um, answering that question today versus uh, five years ago versus 10 years ago or more, is it you end up with a very, very different answer. So the standard story of the ideology that surrounded 
Bitcoin merging 2008, 2009, of course, is this cypherpunk story that we've heard before, right? This idea that, and this is so people like uh, Finn Bretton's book is, uh, excavates that digital cash is the name of the book, excavates that topic very interestingly. Like it, it goes and it talks about, for instance, extropians. These are a very weird group of people who believe in the extermination of entropy and they think about living forever and all these kinds of things. And that's really, I mean, that's there and that's really exciting and interesting. And that was swirling around the moment of, of the emergence of Bitcoin. And many people make a lot of sort of to do about the fact that the uh, mailing list that Bitcoin emerged out of this cryptography mailing list was sort of a hotbed of this kind of political activity. Hmm. I don't discount this. And I don't discount that most of the people dri driven to it, Hal Finney and all these early folks, they were basically libertarians. Many of them were extropians. They were, they came from the right wing political economic ideology, this kind of stuff that when um, David Columbia's book, uh, very controversially st stringent critic, he said, you know, like, this is like right wing ideology. And many people sort of now today look back at it and they say, you're so wrong about that or whatever. And I actually think he was basically right for the moment. Hmm. So I think that's the early story. But the one caveat I'll put on that is that if we like, there's so much imagination around Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't really know much about this individual. But what we can sort of confidently say is that like, if we don't, if we put the, our imaginations aside and, and if we just sort of focus on um, that s sort of seminal moment, Satoshi Nakamoto doesn't appear to harbor any cypherpunk ideologies. I I've, I've sort of read basically everything that can be found mm -hmm. out on him and I don't see that anywhere. He's never mentioned it. I'm assuming it's a he, I'm just, you know, right. Just using um, sort of the generic terms here. Um, and, and so in fact, actually, I think it's much more likely the ideology is a response to the 2008 global economic crisis. Remember that like now, of course, it seems almost quaint because we've got, you know, Russia's bombing people and uh, we've got a <laughs> coronavirus. And I mean, all this sort of 2008 though, I was working at IBM, uh, an enterprise risk management uh, part of IBM at the time. And a lot of our clients were these banks and they were like defaulting and stuff. So I remember this very viscerally, this 2008 moment was a really important deal. And that's like, that's what the Genesis block says. So right. I am, as a, like, as I said, as a scientist, I'm not interested in speculating about some imagination that this individual may have had, or the people who quite quickly jumped on in their imaginations of their, of their political beliefs. I actually just look at it and I say, look, it's really obvious what the, the politics are. It's 2008, 2009 global economic crisis. And I think if you sort of fast forward that and take that out, then you can start to realize that there are these multiple trajectories. And so that's the early moment. And then of course, you have these different waves of um, social activity that get associated with uh, cryptocurrencies. So we have this, you know, emergent uh, social order that comes out of Ethereum, right? Which now I think is often associated with Web3. And so some of my more recent research actually looks at Web3 and the ideology is completely different. In fact, actually, I would say the ideology of Web3 is um, what the sort of fancy term is schismogenesis. It's, a, it's schismogenetic from, so it, it, it emerges out of its uh, inverse relationship to Bitcoin. In other words, it's a refusal of the hodling, of the greed, of the degen of Bitcoin. I would say Web3 emerges out of that. So that's just to say, so what is the ideology? Well, it depends where you look. It depends, you know, and, and I think at this hmm. point, it's fair to say that cryptocurrencies is, you know, the, the sort of social formation around it is broad enough that you can find anything you want in terms of that kind of ideology. To the point where when I model uh, sort of like sociologically, when I model uh, how order is formed um, in these complex social arrangements, I actually think of them in terms of uh, social movement theory. So in the same way, you know, social movements, everything from the Arab Spring to, um, you know, the 99%, 1% uh, protests to you name it, right? Uh, Black Lives Matter. I mean, th and the way that these 
social movements form, the way they cohere, the way they kind of create social consensus, they, uh, where people get their collective identities. These are all the kinds of questions I think that are actually the most germane ones when talking about sort of the ideology of cryptocurrencies. So it's a long way of saying, I don't buy the cypherpunk story. I think it's actually limiting. I think it's a, an early part of the story, an interesting part of the story, but today it's useless to talk about these political origins, unless you're a Bitcoin maximalist. And if you're a Bitcoin maximalist, I got no truck with you. I just think it's hilarious. Wow. Well, that, that expanded my perspective because since we started studying this, I've definitely been influenced by David Glumby's book, which, I, which I've read probably twice in full. Um, huh. So on Glumby's book, there's, so here's like my standard criticism of the critics. They typically pick up on one or, 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 or all three of the following criticisms. One is technology, two is regulation, um, and then third is culture. Technology, well, I mean, software is eating the world. You know, that's, uh, I think that's a truism and technology changes. So if you don't like how something is right now, just wait for a software upgrade. That's how problems get fixed, right? So when people like, um, or David Gerard uh, criticizes, um, you know, some platform because it can't scale. Well, <laughs> that's just an engineering problem. They're gonna fix that. If it's not fixed today, it'll be fixed tomorrow. So it's very short-sighted. So technology criticisms, I don't give them any weight. They're just, they get solved in a version update. Regulation, as we know, changes constantly and ever, it, you know, it's ever changing. The number of times Bitcoin has been banned or whatever um, globally, this country, that country. I mean, when you have 10 years of perspective on this, I don't even blink when I hear some new, uh, whatever, huge regulatory change, because it's going to change again. And the more substantial point is, if you look at the kind of political economy here, Nation states, they bend to the technology. They don't get to run the show. Nation states, the neoliberal nation state has very limited tools to be able to deal with these kinds of uh, technical economic um, disruptions. And so they're the, ever since the beginning, the nation state, the only opportunity they've had is to create uh, regulatory mechanisms. In other words, they, they've been slowly opening up and that's the natural progression. There's no other way to conceive of it because this is the way technology works. You know, you don't get to put that sort of back in the in, in the bottle. And so the nation state just has to constantly bend and bend and bend. And the regulatory apparatus opens up more and more and more, and they'll try to reassert nation state control at certain, you know, edges and so on. So there's that whole story. And, and we, we know very well about what that means. And there is definitely a power to the nation state. I mean, they put people in jail and they, they have uh, a monop monopoly on violence, but nonetheless, that changes. And then the third one's culture. And as I just mentioned, culture has been constantly changing. It, it, you're very out of touch, in my opinion, if you still think that there's a whole whack of cypherpunks running around talking about Bitcoin. That's like less than a, less than a percent of a percent or something like that, right? It's, it's a minuscule part of the broader phenomena. And so culture changes. And a lot of these are subcultural elements that, are, that emerge organically from underneath. And so if that's where your three criticisms stand, well, you know, it's uh, they're hmm. criticisms for the day, for the moment. And they're all three of them are going to disappear or change or you know, radically transform in the future. So if you don't like the culture today, well, just wait a year and it'll be different, right? There'll be some new thing emerging and maybe it'll be worse. Maybe it'll be better, but either way, that's like what we have to kind of address. Wow. So the, the, the ideological origins that I've, I've been thinking so much about for the last little while, uh, are basically irrelevant as it stands today. It's not that they're irrelevant. They, but they, sh they shape, <clears throat> I'd actually say that they are, they're more performative than they are a reflection. So it's not that you've got a bunch of people who come to the, um, the social phenomena, like they come to crypto, they, they get excited about it with, they don't come with a collective identity of like, whatever it might be. I'm a, I'm a cypherpunk. I have like loosely libertarian views. Uh, I, I'm pro-market, whatever these imagination we might have of this, they don't necessarily come to the social context like that. It's rather that the social context is performative to them. So it, it gives them, you get your collective identity by joining. I think that's a much more useful way of framing that uh, dialectic. And, and so when you think about it that way, um, 
Yeah, it's, it's taking a little bit of the focus off that individual belief system, because I think that's probably limiting. And it also is very limiting to also understand how we get like collective actions, right? Because how do we get these sort of structural activities that emerge out of individuals? And, and obviously, there's that whole complex, there's that crypto economic token engineering thing that creates some of that. It, these are complex systems, they have emergent behaviors. But there's a social layer in with that. And so I think the ideology is as much performative as anything else. Performative either in the sense of you get you buy into it, so you become a pro-market libertarian, or in the sense, like I said, in the sense of Web3, you actually uh, stand up in refusal. And, and it's in that refusal. You, <laughs> so you, you define yourself um, schismogenetically in refusal of these other ideologies that you see. And so I think they definitely have an important role to play. It's just not the role we expect them to play. Interesting. Yeah. What, so one of the things that I've heard from some of our audience members as we've been trying to cover this topic is that the when people talk about cryptocurrencies uh, not being immutable and that code isn't actually law, as a criticism, uh, the, the counter argument that I've heard is that they're, they're talking about layer one and layer two, which are like the actual technologies, whereas layer zero is something that's widely recognized within crypto communities as where the influence actually comes from for how the network is designed. So criticizing layer one as not being being immutable is irrelevant because people that are actually in the community consider layer zero to be where those decisions are made. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I mean, immutability is a tricky one, right? Because I think immutability is also one of those concepts that we're still exploring. Like we supposedly we have the technology for immutability, but then we very quickly, like this is what the 2016 DAO taught us, right? We very quickly realized that, um, these are social, social systems. And so like, they're not static. We, they, they're dynamic and they change and they need, then we, what we realize is they need, uh, at least if you want to sort of do one responsibly, they need governance, right? And that's that opens up that whole story around associated with the decentralized autonomous organizations and these kinds of activities and, you know, how consensus forms and how we kind of it's really spoke change management strategy and leadership within the crypto space. That often gets configured as a form of governance, in part because of there's these democratic origins, right? So oftentimes there's this belief that, well, be it voting or some other kinds of mechanism, we can help steer the direction of these platforms. And I think that, so that's the the, the move that often gets made is this, this is where we see the emergence of governance. Okay. I, I've got a, I've got a follow-up question on that now. So if we revert back to governance and if we need humans for governance and I, maybe I'm getting ahead of the questions we have. I don't know, but I, this is where my head's at. Uh, if we arrive back at needing governance from humans, what value are we getting from the software from the, from the crypto system? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's a legitimate question. Uh, critics will often sort of point to this. This is a very uh, specific space where, I mean, why aren't we just using conventional tooling or whatever, um, you know, databases, traditional databases and all these kinds of things. And I think that's a legit question. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit complicated because I think then you now have to start to talk about things like, for instance, the role of trust and how trust gets uh, mitigated by, for instance, smart contracts, right? Um, and that's a very complicated story. Many books have been written about it. Um, I have lots of sort of thoughts to say about that, but maybe it's, um, you know, that's a little bit more in depth. But um, so the technology itself, I think, actually offers all kinds of interesting opportunities that we're still barely mm. starting to understand. And, and so like things just like, think, like imagine like token economics and token engineering, you can do all sorts of interesting microeconomic um, activities that have profound changes for uh, profound social changes. So one, I, I just like to come an example. Um, I've been really impressed with Gitcoin lately. So Gitcoin is this website that provides uh, it's a kind of a fundraising platform for what they call public goods. Um, so it's a sort of form of philanthropy within Web3. And they employ this uh, mechanism called quadratic funding or quadratic voting. Um, many of your listeners are um, surely familiar with this through popularized by people like Vitalik Buterin and so on and so forth. And the mechanism itself is, is this idea that, I mean, sort of to put it um, socially the, uh, or democratically, it's, it's a mechanism that helps give voice to many, um, uh, like amplifies many small voices while sort of reducing shouting, while reducing the big, the sort of the big singular voices or whatever, right? 
and and it sort of does this through you know the way it manages the tokens and it uses this quadratic formula and blah 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 but for me the more interesting part is that that's like a really fast like that changes the sociality of it right that puts people in new relationships and even just going through like so we went through a gitcoin grant um funding uh round recently for a uh, a little collected edition I'm working on with some with some colleagues and it was, it's a very fascinating experience to see like this, like $1, you know, uh, donation come in and all of a sudden we're getting these like, you know, $80 matching or whatever, right? That's how the mechanism kind of works. And that create, I mean, that experience of, of sort of realizing this, it does change your relationship. All of a sudden our, our project takes on a different uh, character. Um, we're responsible in some ways to, 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 you know, to new individuals and so on and so forth. And so, so I think those, that's roughly speaking, I think there's like a lot of technologies, um, micro and macro that can help influence those social um, activities. Hmm. So we're learning, I guess, is the, 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 to, to sum it all up. We're learning how to do that. I have a big picture question for you. How well does crypto, do you think, fit in within a democratic society? Yeah, I, I'm, this is an area that I think crypto is just starting to get to. As we've sort of moved beyond... Um, some of the early sort of Bitcoin uh, concerns and worries. Uh, once we sort of figure out how to do, you know, once we got scaling under control, once we got some of those technical apparatuses under control, we're now starting to see, okay, there are these really interesting democratic opportunities. And one of the, uh, my own areas of focus is trying to understand non-state solutions to these um to, to scarce resource problems, to, uh, you know, social uh, situations where that need consensus and trust and other emergent sorts of behaviors. And so that, um, that process of, can be described many different ways. And one way that many people describe these non-state solutions is to look at people like Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning work. And she talks about this thing called polycentric governance. Roughly speaking, polycentric governance just means it's like, turns out that there's not, there's non-state and non-market solutions to these uh, collective action problems. And there, the answer of polycentric governance is roughly that there's just hard fought, uh, uh, consensus mechanisms that need to, they build trust and they build in all these um, epiphenomenal social, act, uh, you know, uh, underpinnings. And that's that polycentric governance process. And what uh, Ostrom demonstrated in uh, the material world, like, um, you know, situations like uh, overfishing or, or cutting down too many trees and, and these sorts of problems with uh, a couple of uh, lessons pulled from polycentric governance, you, we can solve these problems. And so I think today, I think everybody realizes that there is a huge, just a, a power vacuum globally, for instance, uh, things like climate change. I think most people would recognize that nation state governments um, lack the will or the ability to do a whole lot about these really important uh, collective action problems like climate change. And if you look at the literature, they'll tell you that roughly speaking, this emerges out of a, a global governance vacuum in about the 1970s. That's kind of where that moment happens, where um, basically corporations um, start to take over a lot of the roles. There's a downloading of neoliberal downloading of, of responsibilities from the nation state government into corporations. And now we have this power vacuum. And so we see the emergence of things like corporate social, social responsibility um, emerging to kind of try to help fill that vacuum, right? And that's all fine and well. Um, these are often, that would be like the market response to uh, the uh, global governance vacuum emerging out of nation states. So I think what crypto offers is a whole bunch of non-state opportunities. And this is it, this could be something like a decentralized autonomous organization, which again, as I said, is sort of like a social movement. It's just a bunch of people kind of coming together for getting a collective identity and then taking action um, to any other 
you know, a broad range of, uh, you know, it could be just standard types of voting. Um, you could do all sorts of interesting things with voting to, uh, of course, using the tokens themselves and the value that they have to try to engineer in certain uh, micro or, ma or macroeconomic behaviors. So I think that's where the opportunity of democracy emerges. It's, it's not democracy like we all need to go like vote for a representative party. You know, I'm going to be Democrat or Republican or whatever. Right. Um, I actually if I had an ideology, I would say that's a that's a fairly outdated kind of broken model. Right. Mm -hmm. Representative politics. I, I could go on and on about the sort of deeper traditions of representative politics that emerge out of people like Rousseau. They are very problematic and they're I mean, this is hundreds of years ago. Why are we still using this? We have computers, right? So why are we using um, this crazy idea of, you, you know, every couple of years you go and you vote for some person who yeah. is not representing you in any meaningful way. So I say, like, forget about that. Let's just, and this is what crypto does. It takes little parts, some of the big parts of society, and it refashions them, them in their own sense, in their own, in their own, their own image. And so crypto did this initially with money. It reimagined money in its own image. And it's doing this with things like voting, democracy, right? We see it's doing with law, transforming law in different ways, um, so on and so forth. It goes through, the interesting thing about crypto, as we've seen over the last 10 years, is it takes parts of society that have, we have a traditional understanding of and it, you know, infects it and it changes it and it adds these, and what the, up, so the downside is if you really believe strongly in big institutions and strong nation states, that feels like a threat. I'm not so much, I'm not anarchist enough to, I'm not black block where I think we should go destroy these institutions and these governments, but rather I think that there's an increasingly large opportunity for non-state solutions, in particular dealing with increasingly large problems, collective action problems, inequality, various forms of justice, environmental justice, and so on, so on climate change, on and on and on. The only one wrinkle I'll add is that a lot of the theorization coming out of people like Eleanor Ostrom and these kinds of, when we start to think about these um, problem sets, we sort of lazily drop back into thinking about material context, like overfishing. Well, as it turns out in like a web three in a virtual environment, we don't have material constraints. In fact, we build material constraints. That's what we do. That's what we're doing with like things like NFTs. We're building property regimes, but we get to build them how we want. And that's that opportunity. So you get to build a new property regime, the new economic layer to support the sort of, you know, socially democratic um, uh, mechanism above, but that democratic mechanism importantly doesn't need to be representative you're not just sort of giving your political will to someone to execute but you actually get to take some sort of at least notionally uh directly involved relationship uh or sort of stake in that um quote-unquote democratic process man so do do we end up back at political ideology though where it's like uh uh john locke versus thomas hobbes representation uh how much power should the state have and all that kind of stuff like do, do, does it boil down to that i think at some sort of political level like if you're a regulator this is the like if you're a part of the nation state i think that's the logic that you necessarily end up getting trapped into hmm. um but I don't think it needs to be that way. And I think that's what's interesting about crypto is that we can program in. I mean, I would even go so far to say we can program in anti-power or ways in which you can wow. prevent, um, uh, for instance, poles of power emerging, which then turn into hierarchies, which then turn into, um, you know, basically violence right this is we have we have uh be it labor violence or other kinds of this is the long history of um people not getting to uh you know take have a say in their own uh in their own reality right that's sort of the con that's like so rousseau says about he says about you cannot you cannot you cannot represent the general will you cannot give it away it's it's you it's that's that's the, there's a paradox there about the will right my will I cannot give to another person. It's, it's what I am. It's who I am. It's how I, you know what I mean? And so there's always that fundamental paradox, that Rousseauian move, right? And that leads, the problem with that is that leads into, um, into these uh, state hierarchical 
uh, institutions that also have a really checkered, nasty past of everything from, you know, slavery to inequality to you name it. Right. And so I think there is, if we can, we can take control of, of the sort of social, economic, technical foundation that lies underneath that. And we can program in ways that actually can prevent the formation of many of the things that we find so problematic. This all presupposes, just to be really, really clear, is a kind of like, there's a, it presupposes that there aren't material constraints that people are under. So mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you can't, if you're barely able to eat enough food, um, token engineering is just not really, it, it just doesn't matter to you, right? So I think this is really, really important to stress that fact that this is relevant to people who are like, quote unquote, in um, crypto or in Web3, many of which are already actually rich. Uh, many of these people have already made their money. And actually, I think there's something interesting you said there that now they're looking for new opportunities. They're looking for the breakdown of labor and uh, leisure, right? So that's why people join DAOs, I think, often. It's as much about belonging and community and the social dimensions as it is that um, investment or that desire to govern or whatever other kind of reasons they might join these advanced kinds of next gen organizations. I think there's a whole complex reason why that is. And it, it certainly doesn't boil down to just those purely economic ones. Wow. You mentioned crypto reimagining money, which of course has been very important to the story of crypto. How, how do you define money? Yeah, money is a tough one to define. I, my own personal, um, feelings on what is money is a, li a little bit like how they talk about um you know the legal definition for porn it's like you know it when you see it kind of thing right it's like not erotic or whatever it's you know when it's porn kind of thing um so i actually think it's just like how it gets used i think i think money is probably epiphenomenal i think it emerges out of social relations so it's not like money comes first and then you get social relations and there's a couple stories about money that probably just need to be discounted the first is this um, th this idea that it emerges, money emerges out of this, what's called the double coincidence of wants comes out of like people like Menger who talk about, so you've got, um, some bread and I've got some tomatoes and how are we going to like exchange? Cause nobody wants bread or tomatoes. And so the almost obvious thing to do is to go to this third thing, this completely fungible thing that we call money and we, we swap money and, and that's sort of, and that's the idea how money emerges, right? Cause we've got this double coincidence of wants and it's this, this third thing that helps bind that. Right. It turns out that's like, Anthropologically, there's no evidence for this. And there's a whole host of like challenges. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you sort of piece it through. It presupposes things emerging before the social relations that are necessary to get that going, right? So that's not very good. The other one is like what I call the standard tripartite, you know, uh, model of money, which it takes up things like, okay, is, is money a, a unit of account or a medium of exchange or, you know, whatever kind of uh, nice little frame you might have um that's perfectly like these are is it medium of exchange is money a medium exchange well i don't know i mean like fine i guess that's an okay definition but it doesn't get us very far like we can't really meaningfully say much about um how it works we certainly if we take that approach this is and this is the standard model you see in economics textbooks but the problem is for instance you can't say anything about like capitalism like that model of money has no power in it. There's no, there's no, it's like, where's inequality come from this, right? Well, supply and demand getting out of whack or something. I mean, that's, that's, that's worse shit. Like that's not at all how money works. And if you have anything that resembles a sensitive understanding of it, you'll appreciate that right away. So that's all to say that money has been theorized for hundreds of years by like the giant intellectual giants of the Western tradition, everyone from Karl Marx to, you know, you name it, Smith and so on and so forth, all the way down. So I tend to follow maybe views that emerge out of sociological, anthropological literature, asking questions of like, so people like George Zimmel say, okay, money is a, it's a debt on society or sorry, it's a, it's a claim on society. So maybe it's a sort of people like, um, uh, Graeber say, okay, that's originally money was debt. Right. And that's a decent, like, that's actually something we can start to talk about. And we can say, okay, so like, cause power is right there. So you're in debt to me. Oh, now we have money get going. We have the power relations going as well. We have social relations going all at the same time. So I think that's a much more healthy understanding of what money is. It's less sort of like formalistic and it doesn't mesh really nicely with supply and demand curves and so on and so forth. But I think ultimately that is what money is. Hmm. 
So what impact do you think decentralized censorship resistant monies have on society? Yeah, there's, I think uh, the transformation of money that we've seen over the last decade actually has been fairly profound. There's two parts there that I'd pick up on that were are substantial. One is the uh, potential anonymous nature of crypto, which are pseudonymous, which gives it flavorings of cash. Um, that's a very complicated story there because the security uh, claims, as it turns out, haven't necessarily matched up. The reality hasn't met, matched the, the, the hope or whatever, the dream. Um, so there's the anonymous part of it and, and the privacy preserving part of it and, and even the decentralized part of it. And then um, the, the other sort of, I think, really important feature of that is the programmability. Uh, I've got a colleague, uh, Corey Kalskin at, uh, at Parsons in, uh, in New York, um, who ha describes money in terms of um, like pro programmable money. As he says, we're now dealing with programmable money. And this is roughly just the influence of smart contracts and these kinds of things. But when you start to think about money as being like a programmable like data layer, like a kind of form of data money, I do think you now start to see a lot of changes emerging. And this gets us into things like DeFi and, and so on and so forth. Hmm. Based on how you describe money, which I agree is very complex, um, how, how well do you think the n n well how, the original narrative? But I don't know if the Bitcoin narrative is still that narrative because um, you touched on that earlier. Is it? Maybe, maybe just real quick. Has that ah uh, the, the, like the 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 gold the gold yeah, bugs yeah, and all yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff? Yeah. Those people are still there, out there. <laughs> they didn't go anywhere. So it's still part of the narrative. Um, but gold bugs and this desire of early Bitcoiners to have an economic system that is based on something that isn't the quote unquote, uh, 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 the, you know, the, the authority of the state. Um, or, uh, you know, so they, they didn't, they, you know, the, the traditional definition for sort of kind of a fiat money, right, is this idea that it's, 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 it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's funny money, people will say, the kind of gold bugs will say it's funny money, is, it's just because it's just the state wants to make it up and, 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 you know, that it has no intrinsic value, right? Unlike something like gold, right? Gold has, it's intrinsically valuable. There's only X amount of it on the globe. Um, we can use it for all sorts of things. Uh, the problem with that sort of as a, conceptual theory is it also is not very helpful because first of all, gold's not, I mean, it's a bit like crazy. Nobody actually thinks gold is very useful. Um, I mean, I'd much rather have a lithium based, uh, <laughs> you know, if we're talking scarcity or something, right? Like gold's like, yeah, that like a thousand years ago, it was super, super special. We could make pots and pans out of it or whatever. But um, so I don't think that's a like a terribly helpful description either. And the idea that what Bitcoin people like to say is like to substitute. Okay. So, um, we need a, a, a like a, a hard uh, foundation for money, and they say, "Well, that's math." They say this is the and, and you know people like um, uh, Assange, uh, Julian Assange say the universe believes in cryptography, right? There's this notion that it's this sort of this this mathematical foundation that is. Um, as solid as any gold or, or what what have you, but in a weird way, it's the exact opposite. It has no material basis, right? It just seems to be this thing that, um, for inexplicable reasons, uh, works everywhere across the whole universe, right? Um, so that, there's that kind of substitution there, and I think there's something sort of slightly right about that. It, it is a, a a very you know cryptography is which is actually. The, my, my main area of study really is cryptography, not so much cryptocurrencies. Um, it is something that is very important to society, has a 3000 year history and is, is, is a very, like this is not a technology to sort of discount, but um, it's, it's a little too easy because the way we put it all together is exactly how it matters, right? It's not like you don't, you don't just go out there and find the um, elliptical curve algorithm is sitting ready to be discovered you know it's not sort of we invent it right that's the point we, we make it what we want it to be so unlike gold we actually this is the opportunity to shape 
the economic relations to however we want. We're not constrained by a property regime based in some intrinsic value. Hmm. And that's and this gets me all the way to, if you sort of fast forward this, I actually think the economics of cryptocurrency is much better modeled, not on scarcity, which is a very traditional finance model, right? Um, I would even go so far as to say that there's these scarcity generating institutions, banks and governments and most businesses. Um, Rather, with crypto, I would say it's actually an economics of surplus. Because precisely, it's magic internet money, right? If you don't like your economic relations, just make new ones. That's the beauty of it, right? Like people, people are critical of Bitcoin. They're like, oh, it's such a scam or whatever. It's like, if you don't like Bitcoin, you think it's a scam, go make a non-scam Bitcoin. You can do that. There's nothing stopping you, which is to say... You're not in. You're not really restrained by hmm. constraint and scarcity. It's actually an economics of surplus, and I think this actually goes really broadly. And this is movement. This ties into things like open source software production and so on and so forth. Hmm. Um, it definitely problematizes Marx's concept, uh, conventional theory of of of, of labor, um, and the surplus value, uh, surplus theory of of uh, 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 value and. Uh, surplus labor theory of surplus value. Um, and and I, so I, I think you start to see the breakdown happening uh, socially, uh, economically, uh, and, 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 and work starts to transform when we think of the idea that we can just have more and more and more and more. But again, not more and more like, a, that's not the logic of more of, of uh, that led us to you know, rapid climate change, right? It's not pulling more oil out of the earth or something like this. It's it's virtual more, but that's the whole point. We're, there's no constraints. You can just make the mathematics how you want them it to work, right? It doesn't need to be rooted in, there are only this many Bitcoins and there will only ever be this many Bitcoins. And here's the, you know, the issue rate and so on and so forth. And that, you know, and, and whatever, in 20 years or 50 years or whatever, there's going to be an exact cap and all this kind of stuff. You can do that if you want. If that's your sort of ideological origins, you like, we need to think about um, creating scarcity so that we have correct supply and demand curves and all these kinds of things. Or you can say to hell with all that. The supply and demand curves and you know, uh, efficient hypotheses of, of markets and all that stuff, I think is largely hooey when it comes to cryptocurrencies. And the um, econometric data actually supports this. People are trying these stupid Garch metrics and all these kinds of things that like to try to understand the crypto markets. And no, I mean, obviously, if anyone could figure it out, they'd have a crystal ball and they'd be fantastic and wealthy or whatever. So maybe that's a kind of an obvious point. But the point is, I don't see any of them working. And I think actually cryptocurrency markets are probably sui generis. They don't resemble the markets we have from before because they don't have a foundational rooting, right? They're not based on like, so profit and loss statements. That, that's not a crypto thing. Like, you know, I mean, these aren't, these aren't really meaningful um, uh, metrics, right? And, or you know, I mean, some things obviously, you know, you have to have enough money. You have money has to come in and has to go out. There are uh, economic realities that cannot be uh, sort of reimagined around, but you have a huge, impressively wide latitude about how to kind of program that all up and to make it work how you want to work it to work. And I think that's actually fundamentally uh, a mechanism of of surplus. Okay, I, I have a couple follow up questions. Uh, well, w one agreement. I, I think the the scarcity economics of Bitcoin are pretty silly. And I think it's a complete misconception of money. Uh, it does, doesn't match up at all with your description of money, which I would tend to agree with um, much more. On the surplus economics, though, is is there not still a real world constraint of how much real dollars can come in and go out? Or alternatively, well, I guess that's it. How, how valuable a cryptocurrency is relative to the real world? Because like, like you say, if I... Yeah, these are these are very loaded terms, right? Real world, right? As like traditional finance is somehow oh, rooted in, right? I mean, so this and this is precisely the kind of thing where we can find ourselves, hmm. um, you know, with running into contradictions and paradoxes and these sorts of various kinds of challenges. Um, I don't. I mean, 
it's an interesting question whether or not fiat money has to come in at all in the first place, right? Because so let's go back to those origin stories of where money comes from. Did money come from the first tokens in you know three thousand years ago or whatever? Was there some money that people were using to support that when they made that move? Like, did they need to like mm. bring in some other form of value, right? Or is it sui generis? It just creates it's, it's ex nihilo. It's it's God given. It just you program mm. it up and poof. It emerges. And that's what Bitcoin is, right? Bitcoin didn't. So that people then created exchanges and then brought in a fiat money system and injected it and, and did all that in investment and, and all those. And, I mean, I'm not saying I don't know whether or not that was like necessary, like socially necessary, economically necessary. I don't know. But we we can certainly say that it's not um, it's not sufficient. Right? Like you don't you don't just bringing a bunch of investment of money in doesn't make a, a money system or like a sort of like a, a, bring an investment into a, a kind of money platform doesn't give that any validity or, or success criteria. Right. So that's kind of where I would sort of, I would sort of back that up and say like, here we're, these are private monies. Each crypto is a little private money and it's going to work on its own merits, not hmm. how much was invested in it from a fiat uh, economic system. Okay, I got another follow up on that. Uh, so I, I read uh, Jeffrey Ing Ingham's 2004 book, which you, you've cited in, in your book a few times. Uh, and in there, I learned about the state theory of money, which I, th I think Ingham sees, seems to agree with. Uh, you would probably know how much he agrees better than I do. Uh, but in that case, basically, money is valuable because you can pay your taxes with it. Um, how does that interact with what you were just saying? Yeah, I mean, and that's a really, that's one of those real world. Um, hard and fast kinds of uh, rules. Like, so on the one hand, I'm, I, I want to say like, look, we can, we can program around this stuff. We can, we can create anti-power. We can, we can do these, we can get out, we can get around from these, we, we can create new economic relations that don't involve this. But we also know that if you don't pay your taxes, you're going to find yourself in jail. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, and that's where like, that's where that, that's where we're like, we can just make up fancy math and we can create a really fun economic relationship that's entirely, it's like, you know, regenerative economics, it's totally surplus driven, it's cooperativism, it's, it's everything we want, it's a dream, it's the utopia, but the state's still going to take theirs. And um, that, you know, I mean, that's a different question. That's one, how you feel about the, which nation state and so on and so forth and the role of taxation and, and, and all these kinds of things. But it's a very true reality that the state still has a monopoly on violence. And so um, it's all fun and games to do some exploit on some DeFi mm -hmm. or to tax some exchange or to just make a whole whack of money doing crypto trading. But if you know, uh, the state's going to come looking for you. And as it turns out, we realized that they're actually very good at this. Uh, years and years and years ago, I talked to a, a FINRA um, intelligence agent and he right away, he realized, he said to me, he said, uh, when he saw Bitcoin, he said, this is prosecution futures. <laughs> of course, it's a bookkeeper's dream. You can't cook the books in the past. You know what I mean? It's like, it's very, like, it's all there, you know? And there's this notion of privacy. But as it turns out, that notion of privacy is eroding very quickly as de-anonymization technologies and, and methods and stuff come around and so on and so forth. And, and even if we got it perfectly, to be honest, it wouldn't kind of matter because here's what the role the nation state has taken. They realize they can't attack the system um, centrally. They can't stop Bitcoin. It's not possible. We all know that's not possible. So what do they do? They just work the edges, right? And they're getting very good at that. And, you know, they're able to, I mean, there's stories and stories and stories of, of how, how effective they are at working those mm -hmm. edges, those on ramps and off ramps and that kind of stuff, right? And that's why we see the emergence of KYC and AML and all this kind of stuff. And that's KYC and AML is all great. And they're like, I've, I've done lots of extensive work working with regulators and, and like how to think like responsibly about, um, you know, the obligations to, you know, legal obligations, regulatory obligations, and how we can create mechanisms to permit the healthy growth of innovation and so on and so forth, sandboxes and all that kind of stuff. 
that's all great, but that just presupposes the nation state. And you don't have to presuppose that the nation state. And in fact, actually what's interesting, there's lots of dimensions of your life that have no need for a nation state to be part of it. So DAOs are really good examples of this. These are little clubs and stuff. And it, it'd be weird, I think, if you like in the meat space went and created a club and all of a sudden like the state was like working the door or something. You know what I mean? Like it's just, there's, there's these inappropriate relationships that don't seem to have anything to do with, because I'm. it's one thing if I'm... Um, doing a state activity, you know, uh, if I'm driving down the road or if I'm um, paying my taxes or something like that, then obviously there's a, a very clear role for the government, but in much of life there isn't. And yet what often these things, we struggle to try to form consensus and trust and other social kinds of relationships. And so I think that's where it gets kind of interesting is these non-state opportunities mm -hmm. to shape those. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, you're still gonna be paying the taxes unless you wanna go to jail. So, as it exists today, do you consider Bitcoin to be money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's like a private money, or, or you know, like I, I think every crypto is a money. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm totally. I mean, we use them like monies or whatever. Um, I mean, Bitcoin is like a really, it's a really shitty money. I mean, it's got, uh, it doesn't have great privacy, financial privacy. Um, it's Transaction fees are a stupid open market with no limit. Um, it's cumbersome. You got to be your own damn bank, as David Gerard says. Um, I mean, there's just so many. It's not a great money system. Um, maybe it's an okay for investment, like, you know, like how pe most people use it. Like, you know, just buy it and hold it or whatever. But it, it's a really crappy money. But that's kind of like, I mean, whatever. There's like, those, are, those problems have been solved. There's so many next-gen platforms. Right. Avalanche, uh, EOS, I mean, Tron, you, you name it, right? All the problems around um, like proof of work uh, and the climate impact, that's just like, that's just old and that's just, that's just a hangover. And, and it's a huge hangover. It's a hmm. huge carbon footprint, but it's just a hangover from earlier tech. And we, <laughs> we've now realized we have solutions. We, we, we can do um, complex sourcing techniques to get consensus without having uh, you know, uh, burning up, you know, CPU cycles. There's all sorts of different techniques for, I mean, this is a very, very robust, wow. healthy area of research, right? Um, consensus mechanisms and so forth. Very, very robust. So I think there's a load of new platforms that are out there and that Bitcoin, it's like the granddad or whatever, and, and maybe it'll exist forever or maybe it won't. In some sense, I actually, I don't care. Um, I think there's lots of other cryptos out there and, uh, it's just like it's like the original. Uh, all right, I want to I want to take a bit of a shift into decentralized finance or or DeFi, um, and maybe we've touched on bits and pieces of this throughout the conversation already. But what what do you think gets better in a world of decentralized finance relative to the existing financial system? Better. Let's get what gets better with DeFi. Um, I mean, one of the, I guess the, there's a lot of interesting innovations. Now, I don't know how socially productive they are. Like things like um, automatic market makers and things like that. I think that's really cool, right? These are like really interesting innovations. And this idea of getting rid of like counterparty risk, right? Um, which is sort of one of the main, that's if, if, if Bitcoin gave us one, if one trust impacting mechanism, it's this idea of getting rid of count, counterparty uh, risk. Hmm. Now, that is the slim edge of the wedge when it comes to the whole risk part, right? And I think that's what a lot of like the DeFi um, hacks, attacks, exploits, crashes, whatever, have demonstrated to us that the, when you think capaciously about risk, uh, you, you need to think about operational risk and market risk and all these other kinds of risks, not just counterparty risk. So the fact that you can kind of do a transaction and it's automatic, is cool and everything, but like, that's just a tiny little part of it all. Right. So I guess I'm struggling to say what's so like, what's great out of DeFi. I love, I love that it's the, one of the better experiments to really push the limit of automaticity, like things that just go and can't be stopped. And I think that's actually something that's rather lacking as part of the kind of like crypto imagination because nobody wants to go to jail, everybody 
took on this idea that we need to be like regulatory compliance and all this kind of stuff or whatever. And that's fine. That's great. I mean, as I said, that's, that's super important, but it's really limiting and it's limiting, especially for things that um, have uh, possible activities outside of those where the, the nation state is so interested in. So more social activities rather than the purely economic ones. Mm. Um, nation state already having a, a, a firm hold on those economic ones. And so there's that kind of wrestling period that it has to try to move it away from it or whatever, from the nation state. And this is part of that mechanism. But I'm just kind of, I think it's, it's a fascinating, like, so I've been, one of the things I've, just to back up a little bit, this question of unstoppable autonomous systems, I think is really interesting. And this is one of the places where crypto has still like a long ways to, to go to be create highly resilient organizations, robust organizations. And what one of the things that kind of has bothered me since the 2016, the DAO, um, sort of one of the first DAOs since then to today, one of the things that bothered me is that that automatic, um, unstoppable nature of, of DAOs has really been lost, I think. And actually DeFi picked it up a little bit and is kind of holding it there. Um, and most DAOs today are kind of like these social um, uh, things. And, and that's and th that's fine. And they, they're really be sort of lost them to become super popular and all this, but they've really lost that um, spirit of the DAO, which was supposed to be completely unstoppable, right? And so I think that's, so I think DeFi still gives us that glimmer of hope that we're gonna, we, we might be able to create systems that are unstoppable, but then we still have run into that challenge around, okay, these are, these are, they, you know, change management. Like these are dynamic systems that need to change. They need to have leadership. They need to have strategy and they need to grow. And there we have the question of governance, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not resilient if it's a single point of failure. So now we need to distribute that across these, these changes across a, a broader number of, of people. And that's that big question that um, everyone's trying to crack and it's littered with challenges, everything from getting people involved to kicking out the wrong people to mm. you name it. And what are the downsides of DeFi that you see? I think it's, it's, it's like so much of crypto bleeding edge. And so you have to have such a strong stomach if you want to play in that economic game. Um, mm. And, and, and because of the, the high risk, uh, hmm. various types of high risk. So uh, I would say that the biggest, like I would just say it's just super scary and risky DeFi is, right? And it seems like it's an easy one. And, and then there's all sorts of neat things that like, like little attacks that emerge out of DeFi, right? You're taking flash loans, flash loan on a government's token to to take to overtake a, a platform, for instance, right? Um, that's a super cool thing uh bad <laughs> but it's super cool right and that's the kind of thing you can do with like DeFi, right so i think mm. that's that's kind of interesting mm, yeah it is interesting uh fr from a technological standpoint how well does blockchain solve things in traditional finance that people complain about like slow international payments and t plus two settlement for securities trading yeah i think that traditional finance more than if there's one lesson I, I've seen over the last 10 years of traditional, the impact of crypto and traditional finance, including things like settlement, international settlement, these kinds of things would be that it's not so much that the technology, the, the crypto technology, the ledger technology is so great. It's pretty good. You know, I mean, there's a lot of really innovative ideas in there and, and, it, and it solves a lot of problems. And I think the technology is wonderful in many respects, but I think the more important uh, impact has been that it's woken, uh, it's moved TradFi mm -hmm. along. It's like, it's, 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 it's the scare, it scared them uh, into innovation. And you see this everywhere. You saw this right away with like updating um, speeds for international settlements. You see this, and then you see this in like so many other um, areas, uh, you know, so it's that, I often say to people, people, another criticism people often um, uh, sort of say to me when they hear that, you know, I do crypto or whatever, they'll say, well, like, isn't it all hype? Isn't this just like a bunch of like, it's kind of like somewhere between a scam and hype. Um, and, and, you know, maybe so or whatever, right? Maybe that's, maybe you can say, yes, yeah, just hype. But it, 
don't discount the value of hype. Like wars are fought on these kinds of feelings. Like, yeah, it's just a feeling. It's just people get excited about it, but you can change the world with hype. And that's what crypto is doing. It just like, it makes the traditional finance world look out of date and it boring. Um, Another huge uh, consequence was the labor shift. Uh, many banks, for instance, like up in Canada, there's a bank called a Scotia Bank. They immediately opened up a, a, like a little lab, a little crypto lab, because they realized that what was happening is they're no longer able to compete for labor because all the smartest engineers are going to head over to crypto. They're going to have more money. It's a Silicon Valley brain drain type of problem, right? And so crypto has been very effective at reimagining the labor forces, right? And that's going to have like broad uh you know long-term effects because and, and that's and that's of course the goal of so much of crypto is like mm. education crypto education right now is they realize they need to get kind of everyone invested in the platform to kind of make it to grow it right and so i think those like now you if you're a bank you're going to have to compete really difficult like are you going to go work for coinbase or you're going to work for a scotia bank those are really different companies and I think the traditional finance world understands this. I was recently did a report with, um, with credit unions in the US, talked to a whole bunch of credit union leaders, and they very much have this fear of missing out. It motivates the industry right now. They're <laughs> deathly afraid of losing all the deposits, which they actually actively see moving from, there's evidence, I, you know, speaking many of the executives, and they say they see, they see money going from their um, FDIC insured uh, credit union account right straight over to crypto. So they see that's a, that's, a, that's a systematic attack on their bottom line. So they're very afraid of this, but they also they're in a bind because they don't have the um, internal capacity to be able to you know, their executives don't know enough about crypto, their frontline workers, their tellers, et cetera. They don't know enough about it. And they're having a hell of a time trying to figure out how to get there because wow. these are highly skilled demands, you know, a highly skilled or highly high demand skills mm-hmm. and they command a high price. And so if you want to, you know, if you want a crypto engineer who can also do whatever and all these other things, that's going to be extra and that's going to be more difficult. And it's going to be very difficult to move people into the industry, back into the um, old fashioned traditional industry when they have sort of been infected with the new fun crypto stuff. So I think there's actually like a really like it's the bigger, bigger, broader social transformations, I think that are much more important than the kind of narrow technological advantages. Like some of those technological advantages are there and like how, you know, we could talk about the specifics, but I actually think that's a bit of a, a sideshow for mm. the larger political um, labor reimagination that we see occurring. Um, I wonder if the flows from credit unions to crypto would have changed post Celsius and Voyager collapsing. Um, I say I don't think so. No. And here's why, hmm. because. I've studied this for 10 years. I don't even care. Like, I don't even pay attention when this or that huge, mm. like $250 million uh, was like a hack and it drained this, you know, like, I mean, I've seen this so many times. So I don't even pay attention to that, to be perfectly honest. And so wow. I, I, and I think at this point, the whole machine's too big. It doesn't matter. Like the, we, we keep going through these winners. Like we keep having this really spiky, um, you know, industry, but, uh, and surely some of that is these little contagion effects that happen, you know, one DeFi collapses and it, you know, I mean, same, we see this in, this is 2008, 2009 traditional finance, right? Lehman Brothers collapses and, you know, there's these, these systematic um, activities that can happen, but um the individual small little hacks, I, I think this, I mean, I'm still party to the Mt. Gox uh, bankruptcy hmm. proceedings to go back. So it's 2013. Um, hmm. And that's still ongoing or whatever, you know what I mean? And so, and that was, so that was my first, <clears throat> that was my first sort of flavor of like being be, like seeing Mt. Gox go down and, and losing. I didn't, I'm not, you know, I actually have for ethics reasons, I've never really invested in crypto, but um, I, I lost, a, you know, whatever, a little bit. Um that was like sort of trial by fire. And that was when I was like, 
I was doing day trading. This is like 2013. It was like early on and whatever. And, and I realized, and, and so since then, every hack that's happened, I think that's par for the course. And actually, I would say you're being a little naive if you don't think that there's going to be hacks and scammers and all the rest that comes out of crypto. Crypto is, and not to say that's a haven for this kind of illicit edge case activity, but like, I don't know, you don't go into a biker bar and expect it to be like, relaxed time right <laughs> like that's kind of the metaphor right like if you're in crypto like you've got to pull on your big boy pants like this is going to be you're going to lose money uh you may get rich too but i mean you're going to get scammed who hasn't been scammed who hasn't been hacked who hasn't been uh you know mismanaged a, a transaction or whatever once you've used crypto for a while is par for the course and so i think you get these pundits especially traditional finance people coming in and they're, they're not used to that right they're like oh where's my government going to come in and help me here or whatever. And sometimes they do, they, you know, Mount Gox, the government did step in. So now, however many, five years later, there's some, you know, uh, many of these DeFi uh, platforms are getting hit with, you know, Ponzi scheme, regulatory, uh, uh, you know, uh, discipline and these sorts of things. And so the state's still there and there's still a semblance of, of normal economic activity or whatever, but I think it's a, just a bit naive to pretend that this isn't going to, this isn't a, 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 an interesting and essential part of, of, of what crypto is. And my, my, my colleague, Lana Swartz, she's writing, she writes a lot on um, these days on scams. And uh, I mean, I think she roughly takes a similar position that this is not, you know, scams aren't like a, an add on to the industry. They're kind of, and it's not to say that the whole, it's like, and then people are, oh, oh, well, I mean, it's all a scam. And it's like, well, I guess it's a scam, but so is capitalism. <laughs> so like, if you like, if you were thinking about where money comes from, I mean, yeah, it's, it's also a scam. I mean, it's all a scam if you want to get kind of serious about it. Um, so I, I don't find that a terribly compelling argument. Mm, interesting. I, I listened to Lana Schwartz on your podcast and that uh, she said something like that. Like everything's a scam if you look at it the right way or something like, or, 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 or everything's not a scam if you look at it the right way or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, we have, people have complex motivations, right? Um, it is not, and that are not about economic maximize, you know, rational uh, maximization, right? I mean, or maybe that's part of it, but they have all sorts of other reasons. And some people mm -hmm. just like to watch the world burn, right? And that's fine. I mean, you know, the, that's, they're part of that whole ecosystem too. Hmm. So a business question for you, um, with blockchain for business logistics, which we hear a fair amount about what gets better compared to using a traditional append only distributed database. Yeah. This goes back to that kind of question around what's the sort of advantage of the technology. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, I think there's a, there are, so Business logistics could, I mean, it's a, a broad that can be moving shipping containers around to all kinds of, um, or even digital asset types of uh, management, records management. I think there's lots of really interesting opportunities there. Everything from, you know, I can point out examples um, uh, when you've got, so I gave a talk at Intel years and years ago, and they had this big, um, it was a fab actually, part of a fab, a chip fab like a million dollar shipment or something like it's like a it was like a big box it came in a big crate or whatever and uh it was like a, the contents were like worth like a million dollars type of thing so super important um you know uh, also needs to be highly secure all these kinds of things right and they were looking at like okay like let's 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 track this let's put let's 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 track this on chain we can um, create some we put some environmental sensors on it and so on and so forth we can track it where it's you know built in china and shipped over here and all that that that, that traditional story or whatever um if there's advantages there because they didn't necessarily trust all the people that are going to be handling the product throughout um or at least they want to reduce the risk and i mean i think there's like interesting opportunities um to, to be had. Are they profoundly different from, you know, a, a well-built relational database or whatever? I, I don't, I, I don't think necessarily, but what, where they do differ is not so much on like, I guess the change maker is less the technology, more how the technology is used and how it's represented. So hmm. a blockchain may allow you to, for instance, reduce some of those issues around trust, right? So it's very hard, and this is a, a problem many companies, platform companies kind of have this, they have this challenge where it's like, how do I get you to like get into my silo? 
right? That's a standard problem. I'm IBM and I want to sell you my product, get on my silo. Well, you're stuck there now, right? I mean, in a way, I mean, obviously blockchain has similar sorts of silo and qualities, but one of the ways in which it diffuses that is because now we're, it's not, we can just agree on like, hey, let's just like use Ethereum and it's going to be our like, that's the truth. It's going to be our truth maker, right? That called trust machine idea. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually something that helps change the business relationship, the negotiation relationship. So it's not that it's the technology itself doing the thing. It's more of the context gets put into. Um, when I spoke to IBM early, early, early on, when they were just released their uh, Providence Logistics uh, product that they have, where they track mangoes or whatever, you know, shipment to over to Walmart. And one of the things I realized in talking to them is the biggest gain was not from the efficiency or robustness of the uh, blockchain platform that was that underlied the system. And in fact, actually the IBM blockchain platform is not very blockchain-y in many respects. So it actually doesn't, hmm. the technology argument it kind of gets you know washed away very quickly anyways. But what the biggest change was they, it was a digitization process. The shipping companies are, you know, they have these bills of lading that are like a thousand pages of paper pages or whatever, right? And so crypto starts to make the thousand pages of paper look pretty friggin' ridiculous. Instead, you should have an iPad that does this IBM on-chain thing or whatever it might be, whatever solution you end up with. Yeah. And so actually it was the hype. It was the context. It was the business opportunity that transformed, that started to transform the shipping industry. Now, I don't know where, I don't track the shipping industry close enough to know if there's still bills of lading floating around on these boats or if they're all up using the blockchain or not. But the point is that it's, you can get all, you can really have a radical transformation just because of the, the, the threat of innovation, the disruptive nature, um, or just the kind of business context that these new um, systems get embedded into. So it's less and less about like the like, because we could have a debate about like, oh, this is a good robust system and this is not because it's built like this or it's built like that, or is it fully decentralized or can it scale appropriately and all these kinds of questions. But once you solve those, like you get some halfway decent engineers in there and you start to think hard about it, then you kind of start now, now the interesting part happens actually. Now is when you get to start to say, okay, now how can we change, tra how can we change logistics? Mm -hmm. Right? Like how, how do we, can, do we, now we have like perfect visibility on transactions um, outside of, so third party auditors can come in for instance. So that could be from a regulatory standpoint, that could be very helpful, right? You can't cook the books anymore um, or insurance, insurance agencies, they can do things like an issue like parametric insurance where they see um, right away from some environmental sensor that like triggered onto an on-chain uh, smart contract that issues um, uh, insurance pay right away, right? Things like that. There's all kinds of opportunities you could imagine, um, but they only get interesting once they get that into a, a, a social or business context. Right, yeah, it's crazy, it's crazy. Blockchain had, it sounds like what you're saying is blockchain had a, a really shiny sales pitch that was so shiny that it got people to do stuff that was technologically good, but not necessarily related to blockchain. Yeah, that's precisely I right. I mean, I, I, that's, how I, that's how I read it. I saw, I was speaking to them and they, they didn't sort of admit it as it were because they wanted to say that doing anything is innovative product. But at the end of the day, it was just a good old fashioned, like, here's how we're going to digitize things. And goes back, and to go to your point around like international settlements, like T plus two international settlements, these kinds of things. The story is the same there too, right? It's, it's not so much that the technology made that settlement process faster. I mean, we have computers, we can make international settlements faster. It's the rest of the stuff that slows it down. It's the, 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 the checking and the labor, you know, the validation and, and whatever all those processes are. Yeah. But of course we can imagine that going faster. We can automate some of it. We can streamline some of it. We can cut some of parts of it out. We can digitize it for the first place in the first place. And doing each one of those things is as significant or more significant than the fact that it's on a freaking blockchain. In fact, as we know, many aren't blockchains. They don't have, right. they don't have blocks, they don't have chains. And so and we just sort of comfortable with saying that we're like, oh, it's being disrupted by a blockchain. It's like not a blockchain or, you know what I mean? And but that's, <laughs> that's the point. That's the point, I think. Unreal. Uh, you, you mentioned DAOs 
we, we had Marco DiMaggio on our podcast a, a while ago before we started going down the this path of learning about crypto. And he was, of course, involved in Terra Luna. So that was that was also just an interesting part of that whole story. Uh, anyway, I asked him about about DAOs. Was, how, how is a DAO different from a traditional business corporation? And he said something about transparency or something, but it didn't seem a whole lot different. So how, how is a DAO different from a traditional corporation? Yeah, I think this is unfortunately my my answer will be slightly, you know, it's, it depends. It depends on how we, what a DAO is, right? It's a oh, kind wow. of, a, there's a something of a definitional question there. And that's important because if we look at the DAO from 2016, that was one imagination. It was one version of a DAO. Um, MakerDAO was, was there as well at the same, same time. So that's another version, right? Fast forward to Friends with Benefits or Lobby3, Andrew Yang's political DAO, or hmm. you name it, right? Um, so I don't think there is any one DAO. Um, and I think we're very much learning what we think of as DAOs. As I mentioned before, I'm actually a little borderline dismayed that DAOs have become kind of like a, like a VIP club hangout thing that are more social than mm. they are anything else, or many of them are, I should say, maybe not all, but I mean, it's a very diverse um, ecosystem. Uh, but, okay, so all of that to say, we can agree on some basics of what a DAO is. And there, I think we can start to talk meaningful and things get a little bit interesting. We can talk about, for instance, digital and decentralized governance. Um, this goes back to these um, questions around. So we can now take your traditional organization and we can start to program in um, uh, logics that shape behaviors. And so they're very powerful behavior um, technologies. And so this is where behavioral economics joins into the crypto economic story. And we can start to, for instance, we can motivate people, economic rationality, we can motivate them um, to do things. We can prohibit them from doing things. And we can do this at a very fine grained mm -hmm. microeconomic transactional level. We can create, as I mentioned, things like anti-powers and various sort of um, guardrails. There's all kinds of interesting opportunities you can do there. Structurally speaking, then we can also start to think a little bit at the meso level. We can start to think about how we can get um, consensus forming out of very, otherwise very difficult um, uh, social contexts, right? Where there's very loose relationships to begin with. We can sort of emergently bubble up consensus. And we, we're working on this. Like this is not, you know, I don't think I could even necessarily point to a, a good example of a DAO that's really nailed this or whatever, but that's the, what we're figuring out. And that's a big change, right? These are um, not, they're not hierarchical organizations. Usually they're very flat. Uh, they have all kinds of different characteristics. Their labor, like as I mentioned before, labor and leisure starts to break down in, in DAOs. Many people, they don't even use, so they have like, for instance, maybe they have DAO tokens or, or other kinds of cryptos that they're they used in for governance and other kinds of um, activities. Sometimes they're just for gaining access to information. So that's another opportunity. And the more, the broader point is, this is the sort of, to give it a philosophical spin, there's this notion of, uh, it's called a biopolitical. So it's sort of this idea that's saying that like politics and economics you can't separate them out from the rest of your lived reality. It's they're biopolitical. They're it's your lived experience is, is is political and economic sort of right from the get go. And when you realize that, you start to say, okay, we can't talk about an autonomous political realm like we can in traditional senses because we only engage with politics when we go vote every four years or whatever it is, right? But in a DAO, it's biopolitical. It's you're you're all you're governing. You're having fun. You're you know, you're doing all these activities, these things, you're accessing information, you're, you're, you, you know, um, you're validating your, your all kinds of work activities that also look like leisure activities. And so that breakdown is, I mean, this is partially the gig economy type of logic here, right? And we see this happening in DAOs, right? We see people come in, they're, you know, contractors, and they do a little bit of work, and then they, they come in and they go out and they're, Sometimes they almost look like community members. Sometimes they're sort of look like developers. Sometimes they're this governance layer. They have all these kinds of, it's a very um, complex relationship in there. And I think that's the um, sort of broader context of DAOs that gets interesting. And then we can start to talk about where we can shape behaviors 
And for me, I'm really interested in how we can shape behaviors progressively. So we can have things like regenerative economics, we can reduce inequality, we can um, uh, enhance social relationships, we can do these kinds of things by putting people in these interesting new relationships that otherwise would be hard to do because, you know, the thing about crypto is uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fundamentally about as a technology of value. Um, very directly in ways that money is sort of money is a representation of value. The, the you know crypto really actually is sort of the value is sort of built right in, right? That's kind of where the math part, that sort of idea is is roughly kind of right, is that the value is part of the the system itself. Um, and by shape by moving that val those system that value around, then you can do all sorts of really fascinating um, things. And that's where I think DAOs really um, the opportunity to shine. Is is there, and 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 then other other kinds of organizations can be built as well. That's the next generation sorts of organizations that have very uh, complex relationships with humans and robots or smart contracts and machines and these sorts of things, where you can start to um, see the emergence of almost like transhumanist activities right so it's a little bit it's like we're a sit we can make we're humans but we're making we, we're assisted by computers in some respect and and that can be from everything for uh various types of governance and voting strategies to uh just labor practices right within a dow x needs to be done well how are we going to do it we have to look at our resources and and hmm. um and leverage those and i think that's where the opportunity to move around value in really sophisticated kinds of ways is is uh, what makes DAOs a little different from traditional organizations. We we have a podcast community. There's like seventy five hundred people in there. You sign up with your email address. You have to get approved by a moderator, and then people move up in their trust score. It's kind of like a loose loosely organized organization. There's no token. Like there's no economics going on in there explicitly. Um, That that feels kind of like what what you're talking about. Uh, what what would be different if we turned our community into a DAO? Yeah, and I mean, in so many communities, that's precisely the question they ask themselves, right? Because they hear about huh. DAOs, right? They say, "Oh, well, maybe we need a DAO." Like, what? what? And they sort of they puzzle through that uh, question. I would say it depends entirely on the context, right? Hmm. Um, Unfortunately, so, you know, I, I mentioned before, I said, okay, a lot of times it's just hype and hype's enough and hype, hype will get you where you need to be. Um, hype is, of course, also dangerous. Um, you know, you might be a nice tea company and all of a sudden you think that like you need a DAO or something, you know, or a crypto or a token or whatever. Um, and that probably is a mistake. I mean, just sort of economically, hmm. right? Because you're just not going, I mean, you're not doing the right sorts of things. And um some of that's also about making sure that like there's a, there is a crypto ethos and, and to swim the opposite direction doesn't usually go well. Like, so um, if you wanted to do something that's highly centralized in crypto, you can get, you can, you can do it. Exchanges do it. Um, but you know, they're always kind of in a, in an uncomfortable position. Right. And so you're kind of bucking the trend there. Mm -hmm. Um and so if you have a community that like just doesn't fit in that world well, I, I would say it would be a terrible idea, right? Now, mm. what you can do, I mean, that said, you can do really interesting things once you have um, a gated uh, community, because that's mm. kind of what it becomes, right? It becomes this little... Um, this little world that everyone lives in. You can create property uh, relations. So, uh, you know, I don't know what that, I mean, you could give out NFTs or you could, there's whatever, there's lots of different kinds of relationships you can put people into. And, and that may or may not make sense for a podcast mm -hmm. community, but it may make sense for an investment community, or it may make sense mm -hmm. for a climate change community. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's like these, so I would say it just completely depends on the situation. And then also what you imagine a DAO to be because DAOs today, yes, they very much look like you know, the podcast community and that they're just a bunch of like enthused people who want to, you know, take part. And I mean, this is why pe people use Patreon and stuff, right? Yep. Right. It's exact. it's the same thing or whatever. So, so yeah. I would say like, you know, that situation, maybe a DAO is not, um, not the right, the right hmm. move, but maybe it is for some other community and that would, and that just comes down to the particulars. 
Right. And how you imagine that DAO to be like, what is it? Is it, is, are you trying to, so I've got like, so I, uh, years ago had this idea for, um, an unstoppable charity. I called it the DAO of Wales. And the idea was to like give an actual pod of Wales, a sort of legal economic protection, um, uh, protection from climate degradation and so on and so forth. It never, it collapsed because the 2016 DAO collapsed. So it never got off the ground or whatever, but that idea made like, I think that actually made sense in the in that I was trying to pick up on this idea that charities often well they suffer from a couple of things one lack of transparency often so you don't know where you money you kind of go money goes in uh, like UNICEF and you don't really know where it goes kind of thing right well a DAO would solve that right and the other thing is when it comes to environmental uh, protection we often have this you know because the because governments tend to be running the show when it comes to things like environmental protection you know one minute it's uh they're doing good and the next minute they're like mining the hell out of alaska or whatever right i mean it's it's very you know the the democrats in this this year and the republicans in the next year and like the climate regulatory story changes entirely right so hmm. i say like i'm like you know forget that here's an opportunity for a non-state solution and let's make a system that can't be stopped like Bitcoin. Hmm. So a, a charity, for instance, that like, like Bitcoin, that just sim- the government might not like it, but it still exists and there's nothing they can do about it. Right. And now, I mean, what that, I mean, how to do that. And I mean, that's the particulars that is obviously is very, that's not an easy, it's not an easy lift. And, but we see a lot of cryptos ex- ex- experimenting with this. Right. And, and some of them are really um, malignant. Right. We, the kind of cryptos that we sometimes don't like things like Monero, right. Which is supports so much, uh, dr- uh, you know, illegal drug purchasing, child porn, uh, you know, some pretty, pretty heinous stuff to be perfectly honest. Right. But the bad comes with that really interesting quality of that, like it being autonomous. Right. And so an autonomous charity, I think actually makes a ton of sense. If you, if you got the cojones to be really comfortable with, having things out of your control because that's the thing right like you either slap on some sort of community right. governance layer and then you got then you've got a, a, a that governance community governance challenge where you have to make sure you're not it doesn't get um messed up in some some game economic way or whatever or you take a different model and really just kind of like go protocological like a virus release release a virus out into, into the world right and that virus of course can do bad or good and i think that's Mm. really fascinating and that's and that's where i think like a charity for instance if we had a bunch of um charities like almost like worms that just went around sort of cleaning up the world issuing funds to you know clean up this area or that or or whatever it might be um or sue uh we could imagine um a, a dow suing uh you know exxon or something uh for for some environmental impact it would just, and you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be privy to the changes that might happen from one political year to the next. And so I think that's an opportunity that is right there. And, and, you know, we could imagine all kinds of other DAOs that would have very particular um, needs and that might be well-served. Hmm. Fascinating. How well do smart contracts replicate the role of you know, traditional contractual relations? I think smart contracts are really complicated because um, I don't think they, o- they they often don't do what we imagine them to be doing. So for the most part, smart contracts really just go and they just reduce this counterparty risk I was talking about before. Um, they make sure that, you know, the transaction will, it will occur. <clears throat> uh, you don't need to worry about the other person sort of running off with your, with your funds because they're tied up into a smart contract. That's, that's like handy or whatever. Right. But people then sort of say, okay, the other thing smart contracts can do is they can eliminate trust. And I think that's too quick. And that's too quick for like a bunch of reasons. It has to do with, for instance, what we call smart, what a contract is in the first place. Smart contracts, as Vital Guterin himself has admitted, are probably better called like executable software, right? right? And if we do, if we sort of admit that they're kind of just like software that executes, the sort of wind in their sails is much deflated, right? They're a lot, a lot less impressive. And we kind of have to do that because most of what contracts traditionally do is, aren't, is, not, a, is not, not well captured by smart contracts. So there's a, a favorite example I like to give is there's a, a scholar from the 1960s by the name of Macaulay. 
And he went and, uh, so this is very old, but I think the story is still true. He went and he investigated how uh, businessmen, and it was truly businessmen at this time, um, used uh, contracts, how contract law was, you know, um, used, uh, how contracts were built and, and negotiated and all these kinds of things. And he found out that, to no surprise, if you think about it, um, the like execution part of a contract, like when it like, um, you know, when it sort of becomes real, as it were, um, is, is the smallest, least important part. In fact, he had all these examples where oftentimes people would be, two businessmen would be in a contract and the one would, um, you know, default or whatever, right? And so the other had like a contractual obligation to sue that person or to take, you know, to, to, to discipline them in some sense, right? And they usually don't. And wow, well, that's weird. Why? Like this guy just ran off with your cash or whatever it might be, or he's not finishing the paint job you told him to do. Why are you not hitting him with this um, legal mechanism that you, this contract that you just entered into? And then the reason is because, well, it's a, it's a sustained business. You got to work with this person in the future. Maybe they're an important client or they're this or that or whatever. There's a, a million reasons. And in fact, it turns out actually that how contracts are mostly used is there, uh, we might call it today, a shelling point around negotiation. They allow us to come to terms. And that's a consensus forming process. That's a trust uh, producing process, right? So in the abstract, the smart contract just executes. And like, but that's just like, oh, that's such a tiny little part of it. Mm -hmm. There's the formation, there's all the stuff that goes around it, that, that we have to consider that. And there actually, I would say it's not trust mitigate or not trust minimizing, it's trust shifting perhaps. Um, but it's it's not how we, like, this doesn't happen like that. And then the other and remote and why we, I think kind of walk down that road where we considered uh, smart contract execution to be the paramount feature of a smart contract for, instead of like uh, its negotiation function or whatever it might be, um, is due to Nick Zabo's work and then from the 90s when he really comes up with this idea of smart contracts and he has this notion of uh, vending machine fairness. And so that's the other kind of thorn to that or like other horn here that I, I find smart contracts sort of interesting and challenging is that we want them to be these mechanisms that we can, um, for instance, use like they just, there's an imagination that they create equality immediately because uh, they're, they're just, they're, you know, they don't, there's no bias or anything. They don't, it's not like a court where, as we know, they, you know, courts convict black people much more than they do white people or whatever. There's that, that sort of, that's that, that bias built right in. So this is Nick Zabo's idea. He's like, oh, this is like vending machine fairness. We're going to get like good economic relations just by using smart contracts. I don't think that's right at all. In fact, actually, um, I think that mechanism can be sort of hijacked to to create inequalities, and and mm. that's like kind of largely what we've seen in the crypto world to to today, high degrees of inequality. Um, so yeah, it turns out smart contracts don't work, I think, quite how we imagine them to, you know, to actually, uh, you know, we focus on the wrong wrong things when we think about smart contracts. But they're super important and powerful, and there's lots of, you know, that's that programmable money thing that we can do with them. It's just that we need to recognize that um, they're embedded in a in a more complicated context. Hmm. You mentioned earlier that you have not invested much in crypto, other than maybe experimentally. What are the ethical challenges unique to researching cryptocurrencies and blockchain? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. I wrote a paper um, published in Crypto Economic Systems um, out by MIT Press uh, that addresses many of these kinds of issues of researching um, and des research and design um, and development of, uh, of crypto. Um, there's a bunch of features here that are challenging. For instance, Many types of research are kind of like pay to play. Um, if you want to, for instance, there's, there was early on, there was a lot of research that looked at trying to manipulate cryptocurrency markets. First of all, today, if you're a cryptocurrency researcher and you're dead set on manipulating cryptocurrency uh, markets, you're probably going to get a call from the authorities, <laughs> but this was like 2013 or whatever. Right. And so people thought it was perfectly okay to manipulate markets, open markets for purposes of research. Right. Uh, I mean, in some of the early, there were like some of the early research, if we go back to 2013, 2014, when uh, crypto was new enough that we didn't quite like 
take it seriously, but also was like able to be small enough that could be manipulated quite easily. Some of these researchers, they had like one, there's one um, article from 2013. They had something, they could control like a third or a half of Bitcoin's uh, market just using a variety of techniques that we're, we're now quite fairly familiar with. Um, hmm. And like, that's a problem, right? Like that's, uh, uh, you know, this gets into the same debate that they have in the computer security world where, hmm. We need to have researchers um, attacking these systems. We need to have them, you know, banging on them to, to get them robust and strong and everything. We need to educate students um, how to do this, like, you know, defensive uh, cybersecurity measures and so on and so forth. And like, we need, like, we can't pretend like this doesn't exist, but we need to be super careful about this because it's ripe for, um, misuse mm. uh people there's this sort of famous case of philip dian uh, an important cryptocurrency researcher posted on twitter years and years ago asking the community like you know he was clear he's a grad student at the time and um he was probably teaching some some class and he said he asked twitter and he said is it a, is it appropriate to teach students how to break um main net real contracts uh in a classroom and that's really right. I mean, that's a little like, I mean, the, the metaphor I might say is it's a little like teaching them how to break into the bank. Um, hmm. And of course, security researchers will stand right up and say, we need to be able to do this. I mean, this is how we protect these systems. But on the other hand, we need some really strong ethical guidelines around that, right? We need to have good controls. We need to, um, you know, we need, there's needs to be bright line prohibitions, uh, you know, and then this article talks about a whole bunch of like guidelines, mm -hmm. everything from thinking about like, okay, well, you've got a token that's like a research token or whatever you're, you're investigating. Well, like think about it's like, it's, it's a um, lifespan, right? The same way we do with other assets. We think about their like complete life lifespan. Right. Uh, and because as it turns out, I mean, I, myself, I, I know I've belonged to many little uh, academic communities that, you know, various a lab, in 2013, um, thinks, hey, there's this Bitcoin thing. Why don't we buy a, we got a little grant. Let's get a couple hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin or whatever, right? Fast forward to 2020, they're sitting on a few million. Now, I mean, uh, wow. good for that research lab or whatever, huh. but now you have to really start to question things like uh, bias, right? Uh, can we actually believe the results that are coming out of this lab? They definitely have a financial um, conflict of interest. And- wow. Crypto is no different than many other, um, like, basically, there's a number of technology industries that have these same kind of research challenges, research and development challenges, things like pharmaceuticals, or um, the tobacco industry, or biomedical, right? Where, I mean, years ago, it was the case where the biomedical industry, like, the, so the, the research industry, the, the, the publications, they actually wouldn't, they had a bright line prohibition. If you were a, a researcher, you were not allowed to, if you wanted to publish in this top journal, you were not allowed to take money directly from corporations for, for, to do, for your research, right? And they were very concerned about financial um, conflicts of interest, right? Because we know, actually, in fact, that people are very susceptible to even very small uh, influences. In fact, more effective than giving people a million dollars is probably just taking them up for a nice steak dinner and telling them they look good, things like this, right? We know this works because this works from this worked in the um, pharmaceutical industry. We know you can buy doctors and stuff like this, right? So the playbook, of course, can be the same. The playbook can be the same for crypto. And in many cases, it is. They're, they buy top researchers. They buy universities. They, inv they quote, unquote, in they're investing. And of course, the universities are more than happy to take, uh, you know, half a million dollars from IOHK or IOH. IKOH, whatever that one is, over in Edinburgh there. Or um, recently, I actually uh, was not successful, but I put an application into for uh, Algorand. They're creating these centers of excellence. They're investing $200 million in these uh, large research organizations within, in, inside of universities. This is not unusual. This is how every industry works. This is exactly the playbook. But my broader point is it's not without its challenges, right? We're not going to, like, we have to, if we're thinking about scientifically, we're, we're in some dangerous territory here. And then there's other, like, little interesting novel challenges around things like, um, oh, 
uh, how how results or like uh, negative results are reported and disclosures are reported. Um, you can imagine if you're researching, you discover security uh, exploit. There's a sort of a it's a very difficult situation to how to how you might report that appropriately. Computer security researchers have things like bug bounties and other mechanisms for disclosure of exploits, these kinds of things. But um, as Imin Gunsur actually uh, wrote, he thinks this is fundamentally uh, inappropriate. These are bug bounties and these kinds of mechanisms for disclosure are inappropriate for crypto because they're like these critical systems worth so much, right? They're just not, there's a big difference between um, a bit, a, 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 you know, and uh, a bug in a Bitcoin cash wallet than there is in your calendar app, right? There's just like a big difference there. And I think trying to make the mechanisms of for disclosure, um, security disclosure, and these kinds of things work from one over to the other is something, this is another case where crypto needs to, like, we, this is a learning process that we need to figure out what these appropriate um measures and controls might be and so so there's like a whole bunch of and there's a whole bunch of issues associated with researching and developing crypto and it all comes back to the fact that like uh nanotechnology um technology very small or biotechnology technology of 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 life cryptocurrencies i think are kind of like technologies of value <clears throat> you get to, and this gives us new playground mm -hmm. where we can we can play with value in very direct kinds of ways. Again, sort of not in the way that traditional money works where it's kind of a bit of a representation of value, but actually I think we get to actually program that value directly. And so that gives, so that's, that's, the, that's the ethical challenge and that's the ethical, mm. and that's the opportunity that we get to, we have these technologies to deal with this new set of activities in life in ways that we've never had before, but they automatically throw up all kinds of issues. In the same way, you know, we think we're worried about nanotechnology because we don't get turned into gray goo when the thing escapes the lab and, you know, whatever replicates itself, replicates and eats the whole universe, right? That's the fear there. And we have fear on AI and singularities and all these kinds of things. So I think there's some kind of same fear when it comes to technologies of value. And it might be one just simply of, of inequality, right? Mm -hmm. If you have any, if you have technologies of value and you're not distributing it fairly or whatever, um, maybe that's our big issue. I mean, I don't know what the big issue is, but I think that there's a whole host of issues that when you start to research and develop it, you really need to think about those, at least if you want to be responsible, right? Mm -hmm. Somehow ethically um, and morally above board. Wow, that really makes you think. Um... So you've been watching and researching crypto blockchain for a long time. What do you think have been the biggest disappointments? Oh boy, disappointments. I mean, I don't really have disappointments in so far as like, I don't, I'm not betting on any horse or anything like this. Yeah. I will say that, um, I think Dow, I, I was very excited over the last couple of years to see Dow's reemerge, but a little dis disappointed that they, um, they kind of, you know, they were like, uh, they burned a little too brightly or something, right? Hmm. So uh, they became very, very popular and they lost a little bit of, think, I think, of their, uh, their initial spirit and some of the motivations around them maybe got a little bit twisted up and we're talking too much about apes and not enough about... Um, you know, collective action problems. Right. So right. a little disappointment there, I guess, in some sense, but I don't, yeah, I don't have disappointment because I don't, I don't really, I, that's not how I kind of look at it. I look at it as a, uh, an emerging, um, as an opportunity to study an emerging socio-technical uh, activity. Right. Um, and so I love, I love when there's like crazy stuff that happens. Uh, you know, I mean, it's very sad when people lose their life savings and all these kinds of things, but um <clears throat> To be honest, as a researcher, that's what draws me to it. Interesting. Uh, wh what about the biggest successes? I mean, this thing's been around since, I guess, 2008 as an idea, 2009 as a, as a thing. What, what is the biggest success of, of crypto been? Um, the biggest success, which is also the biggest danger, I would say, is that this goes back to this idea that uh, crypto is fundamentally a kind of behavioral technology. Again, a, mm. one of that, and that's able to control value, um, and that crypto has consistently reimagined um, 
socio-technical realities outside of the narrowly economic and reimagine these in its own image. Hmm. So we see, as I mentioned this before, but we see this, so DAOs are starting to reimagine organizational forms. Um, various uh, voting, you know, quadratic, we could say maybe quadratic voting is starting to reimagine democracy, uh, ex examples ad nauseum, but it's the way in which, and this is just a function of it really being, um, this is kind of like, this is it being a technology. This is, uh, I mean, more than anything, I'm a historian of technology. And when you start to understand how technology works, you recognize that like, it's this special thing that humans do. It's what makes us humans. Um, and it gets to run the show. Like the, the technology is, um, is the heart, is the rock. And, and sometimes it can be kind of almost immovable. And I think socially that's super important. Um, and, and I say dangerous because, I mean, I'm a Canadian. I actually think the Canadian government is great in many respects or whatever. So I'm, I'm not opposed to that, um, you know, having a government, uh, sort of living in a world where there's like a strong government and all these kind of things. But what we see crypto doing is taking parts of the lived reality and reimagining it. <clears throat> and some of them I think are going to be like super successful and will grow and grow and grow. And some are just going to like fade out, right? Like um, everything from like in my book, I, I kind of have a little diagram sort of getting my interpretation of like the things that over the years become exciting um, and they change and some of them are evergreen, right? Like gambling maybe like, or, you know, like that's a, an exciting opportunity. When NFTs emerged, everyone all of a sudden have, NFTs are like a, not a new idea by any stretch, right? They're kind of very obvious that we might have NFTs, but that emergence allowed us to re, start to rethink uh, property relations, digital property relations, right? And then and then bringing in all kinds of really cha interesting challenges too. Now we have um, people stealing apes and saying, well, it's the code is law again, or, or we're back to that story. Um, what, or, or people then get confused to say, well, okay, you own that ape, but I'm just going to like copy and paste it or whatever. And they, they like, as though that's um, an act of, uh, you know, doing something wrong or something like this, right? That's to say that we, we're now starting to rethink what it means to have these, these property relations. And um, when we start to move into like really future looking kind of organizations, they're built on these new property relations. And so that's now something we get a very different flavor of how things work. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's really, I mean, that's really exciting. Hmm. You mentioned being a historian of technology do you consider crypto and blockchain to be a technological revolution? I think revolution is a tough term. <laughs> um, it is a, uh, it's certainly a, an evolution of money. Um, it's an evolution of uh, a number of uh, specific technologies. Some of the sort of consensus technologies that emerged that came out in the 1980s. Um, as far as a revolution, uh, I mean, here's the one way I would say, I would be willing to say it's a kind of a revolution is that we, when we start to, I mentioned this before, we start to think about these activities as social movements rather than organizations, rather than individuals, rather than even communities, actually. I think communities can be unhelpful often because communities seem very static, don't they, right? Mm, social movement has much more dynamism built into it. This, I think we all kind of agree when we think of social movements, they're very dynamic, they're leaderless, they have a lot of different kind of qualities. They're, they're, um, there, maybe we can start to talk about revolution. I mean, failed revolutions, certainly, right? Social movements never succeed in, in their entirety, but they succeed in some goals, right? Um, maybe they're squashed by an oppressive government or maybe the bankers come in and, and do something, you know, uh, against the, that social movement or whatever it might be. They're not necessarily that they're going to succeed, but that there's like really interesting opportunity for them to, for social movements to really get to that next level. And that's because there's, they have, technologies of value at their disposal. They have economics of surplus. They have um, crypto economic and token engineering mechanisms and they can create anti-powers and they can create all these sort of fascinating things 
there I can see a revolution, like a know, silent revolution, mini revolution like that. I can see that emerging. And that'll happen, I think, at very local scales too, to be really, really clear about this. This could be like a revolution in like, well, it could be revolution in the charity industry. I mean, these little, it can be just revol- it can revolutions in small little pockets of interest, of mm-hmm. people who trade baseball cards or something, right? I mean, th- we can imagine these little, a huge, like, uh, uh, I don't think there's going to be some revolution where, you know, a complete transformation of society. I think governments are far too powerful to begin with if for no if many reasons why but starting with a revolution of crypto would imply uh an, 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 a substantial increase of non-state um uh technologies and solutions for right. things that formerly were addressed by the state the state's not going to do that easily right um they're not gonna they're not going to give up taxation for instance because that's the that's the essence of what a, a state is. That's how a state emerged is from its ability to take taxation. Wow! All right, Quinn, that was our last question. This has been a phenomenal, mind expanding conversation. I mentioned to you before we started recording that we've talked to a lot of skeptics. Uh, I, I don't think that you are a skeptic, uh, well, not not in all respects, at least. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you come at this as a not, not as an ideologue, but as a, as a scientist, which I mean, it, it's, it's refreshing to, to hear a different perspective that's not ideologically driven. Happy to be here. It was super, super interesting, and I'm glad, uh, I'm glad it was uh, informative. It certainly was. Thanks, Quinn. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.